Hi, my name is Marco, and in this video I will introduce you to the statistical analysis of listening tests. These tests provide us an indirect way to assess the human hearing perception and are therefore heavily used also in our group. To start off, let's consider that general principle of psychoacoustical experimentation. Say we have come up with a question about human sound localization we would like to answer. Now, the next obvious step for us is to uh, do a proper literature review to find out whether that question has already been answered or not. If not, that gives us a research question, then, which we then need to formulate into proper testable hypothesis. After that, things get more straightforward, so we design an experiment to test that hypothesis. We collect our data or observations which are in general uh, samples from a much larger set of population. And what we would like to do is to draw some conclusions about the general population based on our observations, and that's what the stats are for. Now, in statistical testing, we always aim to falsify the null hypothesis. Now, let's consider a simple example that explains why the aim is to falsify and not to verify the hypothesis. Say our question is whether it's raining outside or not, and our hypothesis is that it's raining. Now, with that hypothesis, we could come up with a premise that if it's raining, the roads will be wet. Hence, our experiment could be that we simply go out and observe the roads. And if we find the roads to be wet, we could conclude that it's raining, and that would verify our hypothesis. However, there's always an alternative explanation for the observations, and in this case, it could be that a sweeping truck has just cleaned the road. In other words, verification of a hypothesis would require ruling out all possible alternative explanations. But if we observe the roads to be dry, we can conclude that it's not raining. Hence, we can always reject the hypothesis or reject our hypothesis if we find enough evidence against it. Now, when you start your analysis, it's highly recommendable to first take a look at your data and plot some descriptive statistics of it. Often, the visual inspection already reveals the effects that you have observed or will observe. To illustrate how to do this, I've generated this MATLAB example where, the, where we first generate 100 samples from a normal distribution and plot the values in terms of descriptive statistics namely the me median value, the quartiles, and the sample mean. The quartiles, shown here as the blue error bar, are a non-parametric non representation about the variance in your data. Namely, half of the values fall within the quartile range, as 75% of the values are larger than the lower limit and smaller than the higher limit. The red asterisk here denotes the median value that divides the data in half as there are equal number of observations below and above the median value. The sample mean is shown with a black circle, and if the median value and the sample mean are closely, cl closely the same, your data is likely to be normally distributed. If they are widely apart from each other, then the normal distribution is at least skewed, or the data is following a completely different distribution. Now, as I said, the visual inspection may reveal whether there is an effect or not. And for instance, if the quartile range wouldn't include the uh, value 0 in this plot, that would be a good indication that the underlying mean in our data is also non-zero. Likewise, if you have two or more conditions, and the quartile ranges of the different conditions do not overlap, then the underlying means are likely to be different as well. Now, the nature of the data that you have collected also affects the kind of tool you can use in your analysis. Say, depending on whether you can uh, assume it to follow a normal distribution with an unknown mean and variance, uh, if, it, if that's not the case, then you should use non-parametric tests in your analysis. This could happen, for instance, if you ask your subjects to rank the stimuli that you presented in terms of loudness, and you end up with our ordinal data. Now, if on the other hand, you can assume that the data is normally distributed over the whole population, then you can use parametric tests. But the next question is, how complex is your data? How many levels you have, how many conditions you have, how many factors you have in your data? 
If you have several of those, then you should use so-called analysis of variance procedure, which we will focus on the next session. If you only have one or two conditions, then you can use student t-test in your analysis. Now, in this tutorial, we'll focus on the student t-test, which is a test for mean or means, assuming that the underlying data is normally distributed. In the simplest case, we have only one condition. Say we have measured log license errors for a sound presented from the front of the listener, and if we then plot the histogram presentation of our data, we could have obtained a graph that looks something like this. Now here, the horizontal axis discretizes the range of our values in a certain number of bins, and the vertical axis tells us how many observations we have per each of those discretized bins. If we then plot that in a continuous form, we could obtain a graph that looks something like a normal distribution centered around our sample mean. In the univariate t-test, we use that data to test the null hypothesis H0 that the underlying mean is not underlying mean zero against the alternative hypothesis H1 that the mean is non-zero. Similarly, if we have two conditions and we have measured the localized errors in the front and the back, we could have obtained distributions such as these two differing in terms of the sample means. We can then use the pair t-test to test the null hypothesis that the underlying means are actually the same, while the alternative hypothesis is that the means differ. Now if we take a look, closer look at the pair t-test, as the univariate test can be seen as a simplified case of it. Let's again assume that we have measured the localization errors in two conditions, front and back, of the listener, and collected n observations for the former and m for the latter conditions. To use the pair t-test to test the hypothesis that the underlying means are actually the same, we first need to compute some descriptive statistics, that is, the sample means and the sample variances. From those values, we can compute the t-test value by simply subtracting the means from each other and dividing that result with the square root of the sum of the normalized sample variances. Upon obtaining the test value, we can compare it against the probability distribution function of t distribution that looks something like this. So it's a symmetric distribution centered around the zero, where the value on the vertical axis denotes the probability at different points of the distribution. The shape of the distribution depends on the degrees of freedom, which on the other hand depend on the number of observations we have. If the sample sizes are equal, the degrees of freedom are simply the total number of observations minus one. If that's not the case, then one must use the Welch shadow weight up formula shown here to approximate the degrees of freedom using the sample variances and the sample sizes. Now, once we have obtained the distribution and the test value, we can compute the probability for our null hypothesis. As the distribution is symmetric and the test value can also be positive or negative, depending on our sample means, we obtain the probability for our null hypothesis by integrating the probability mass that remains beyond the test value on both sides of the midline. That helps us the likelihood that we could have observed such a difference between the means or the sample means when the means are actually the same. Now, if that probability remains below a certain significance level, alpha, we can reject our null hypothesis and conclude that the means are likely to be different. Typically, the alpha is set to either 5 or 1%. Let's now return to MATLAB in order to see how we can run the pair t-test there. In this example, I've generated 10 samples from two normal distributions that differ slightly in terms of both mean and variance. I've also computed the sample means and the variances for both data vectors. Now, based on those values, we can use the above presented equation to compute the t-test value and, as the sample sizes are equal, the degrees of freedom we can obtain by simply computing the total number of observations and subtracting a value of 1 from that. Now, if we plot the corresponding probability distribution function and the test value on both sides of the midline, we can see that there seems to be a, quite a lot of probability mass remaining beyond the test value. Now we can use the cumulative probability distribution function, TCDF, in MATLAB 
to compute the probability for a null hypothesis using the test value and the degrees of freedom. If you like, we can also use the depicted values to estimate that probability. Now, both of these values turned out to be around 11%, meaning that we didn't ex exactly find enough evidence to reject our null hypothesis. Now, to summarize, in this, this tutorial, we have covered why stats are used in psychological experiments in the first place, and why the hypothesis testing runs on the principle of falsification. We have also covered the importance of visual inspection, as typically the effects that we get are already visible in the plotting of the descriptive statistics. As an example, how to validate the statistical significance of the observed differences, we've used the student's t-test to compare the means of two conditions in, in order to see whether they are statistically significantly different from each other. In next time, we would go for the more complex scenarios where we have uh, several levels and several factors affecting our observed value and how we can use the powerful analysis of variance procedure to analyze such data. I hope you have enjoyed this tutorial and hope to see you next time.